Hi, I'm Lael, and my father's going to talk about John Madden and his history in Pleasanton. We hope you enjoy learning about all the different places and at the same time learning how the city of Pleasanton shapes John's history. You see the sign? This is one of my favorite parts of Pleasanton. It was made possible by a group of women in the 1900s, sponsored by Phoebe Apperson Hurst. Wow, hats off to her. She was a strong feminist in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and she lived here in Pleasanton. She passed away during the Spanish flu in 1918. Something to notice is the banner hanging below the sign. Forever in Our Hearts, John Madden, 1936 to 2021. You might wonder, how is John Madden linked to Pleasanton? It's interesting, and I'll take this time to give you the details. John Madden and his family has lived here since 1967, and they continue to live here to this day at their home in the foothills. He's survived by his wife, Virginia. His two sons, Joseph and Michael and numerous grandchildren. John was born April 10th, 1936 in Austin, Minnesota. Not Texas. His family lived on a budget. His father worked as an auto mechanic. The family decided to move to California in Daly City, which is located south of San Francisco. John was very young when he moved. He was enrolled in a private Catholic elementary school. One of his classmates was another John, John Robinson, a former football coach for USC and later the LA Rams. He still works today as a football consultant. John and John grew up as classmates, then went their separate ways. Madden later went to Jefferson High School. John Madden played football here as an offensive and defensive lineman. Obviously, the landscape has changed to turf, but it's still the same field. John went on to graduate from Jefferson High in the class of 1954. John Madden donated the money to renovate the football stadium. Behind me is Jefferson High School, where John graduated in 1954. He was a fantastic student athlete, playing football, basketball, and baseball. His basketball jersey number was 54, the same year as his graduating year. So yeah, 1950 to 1954. He earned a scholarship to go to the University of Oregon. He had all the details worked out, but plans changed. He ended up going to San Mateo Junior College. Later on, he earned another scholarship to Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. where he attended 1955 through 1958. Before he left, however, he met his first love, Virginia Fields, at one of the many bars in Pismo Beach. They met, fell in love, and got married on December 26, 1959. Also, at that time, in 1958, John was good enough to be drafted into the NFL by the Philadelphia Eagles in the 21st round as a lineman. 
during training camp, John suffered an injury that ended his career. This turned out to be a blessing in disguise. At that camp, John met Philadelphia Eagles quarterback Norm Van Brocklin. Van Brocklin to this day owns the NFL record for single game passing yards with 554. After John got injured, Norm sat down with him and reviewed game film and quickly realized how good John was at talking strategy and game logic on how to better prepare for their upcoming opponent. John enjoyed it so much. Keep in mind, he majored in education, so he found ways to combine his two paths into one which started his career as a football coach. After a bit of searching, he found his first job at Allen Hancock Community College. He worked there from 1960 through 1964. Hancock College is located in Santa Maria, which is close by San Luis Obispo. He was later promoted when he was hired at San Diego State University, working under coach Don Coriel. Madden led the Aztecs of SDSU to the number one defense in the country for two years straight, from 1964 to 66, amassing a 27 and four record. Oakland Raiders owner, Al Davis, took notice and offered Madden a job as a linebacker's coach for the Raiders in 1966. Wow. We're here at the old Oakland Coliseum, which has an important link to John Madden. So, this stadium has been home to the Oakland A's. When the Raiders were formed in 1960, they didn't have a, ho a home to call their own. They played in multiple locations, including Kizar Stadium, home to the San Francisco 49ers the team finally made an agreement with the A's to call the Coliseum their home in 1966. That was the same year Al Davis offered the linebacker's position job coach to John Madden. So the Raiders called the Coliseum their home in, 19, in the 1966-67 season. That same year was so pivotal to the Bay Area, especially for the black community. The same year, in 1966, the Black Panther Party was formed in Oakland to combat racial justice. In terms of bad, the Bay Area is one of the most racist communities in the nation. The organization was founded in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, two very important names. John Madden worked as a coach for the Raiders for 12 years. Two years as an assistant coach and 10 years as head coach. John Madden was 32 years old when he was named head coach, the youngest ever at the time. He proposed a philosophy of coaching with three main ideas. The first being defense first, which was expected because of his defensive prowess. The second idea was establish a strong running game, which meant build up the offensive line. Thirdly, ensure a consistent short passing game, 
making good use of the tight ends with a surprise deep threat at wide receiver. This philosophy made the Raiders absolutely stellar during his 10 years as head coach, consistently making the playoffs. The Raiders won one championship, Super Bowl XI, defeating the Minnesota Vikings on January 9, 1977, by a score of 32-14. to It was his first and only championship before he retired. In 1960, no, in 1977, 78, he retired with one Super Bowl victory. He was one of only three coaches under age 42 with over 100 wins. The other two being George Hallis of the Chicago Bears and Vince Lombardi of the Green Bay Packers. Adding John's name alongside two other legends is incredible. During the 10 years John spent as Oakland's head coach, NFL Films captured some of the most famous plays in NFL history. The first being the Immaculate Reception which happened during the fourth quarter of a divisional round playoff game on a cold day in Pittsburgh. The Raiders were leading, I think, with 10 seconds left when Steelers quarterback Terry Bradshaw scrambled and threw an errant pass, which was deflected by Jack Tatum. But... Steelers running back Franco Harris caught the ball before it hit the ground and ran for the touchdown. Another famous play featured tight end Dave Caspers in the Holy Roller against the San Diego Chargers. Quarterback Ken Stabler fumbled the ball, football and no player was able to control it until Caspers finally fell on the ball in the end zone for a touchdown. Also, in a game against the Baltimore Colts, Stabler threw a long pass to Caspers and the tight end bent his body backwards to make the catch in the famous ghost-to-post play, which helped defeat the Colts that day. The last play that comes to mind features Clarence Davis running back number 18. A pass was thrown to Davis against the Miami Dolphins, against several defenders, and Davis ended up catching the pass for a score. That play is now known as the Sea of Hands. There have been so many memories tied to those years of Raiders history. People will say, if you ever need an example of how to build a strong character and strong will, just look at the Raiders and John Madden. He really built a dynasty with his high character. He resigned from coaching for various reasons, but mainly for his health. But that didn't stop him from wanting to continue working in sports. He ended up finding work as a local sports broadcaster. And the people loved how he talked about game strategy, which ended up helping everyone who watched understand the game better. 
CBS, one of the big four television networks, took notice and decided to hire John as a broadcaster working alongside Pat Summerall. As soon as they started working together, it totally changed how Americans watch sports on TV. Before, watching football would be dry, boring, and simple. Run, pass, route. Those who didn't understand the game had a hard time following, leaving the watching only for those who knew the game. John and Pat's work made the game that much more enjoyable, drawing a bitter, bigger audience and making the game fun for everyone, not just doing the play-by-play, but also going into each other, each of the players' history. With this additional information, people who once didn't know football found themselves enjoying the game and wanting to be a part of the football community, all because of John Madden. John continued his broadcasting career for over 21 years in network television. It was really a wake-up call for television, because in the past, sports was never really viewed as entertainment in TV. Until John brought his voice to the game of football. Then he was offered broadcasting jobs across all four major networks. CBS. NBC. ABC, and Fox. With his 21 years in network TV, plus his time in local, broad, no, local networks, his career spanned over 33 years. He is also credited with coming up with new terms, which many viewers use to feel close to the game. For example, his most widely ter used term was boom. During a football game, he would say boom as a way to describe a big hit so people could feel the intensity of the play. That was one of the ways John made the game more fun to watch. Families could get into discussions during a game, which never would have happened otherwise. His career as a broadcaster also provided the opportunity to be on the cover of a video game in 1988. And his likeness is still being used to this day. Hi, we're here at the headquarters for Electronic Arts, or EA Games, where they make all their video games, located in Redwood City. One of my favorite games is Madden 22, which features Patrick Mahomes on the cover. I'm here inside the headquarters for Electronic Arts, or EA, where they make their different video games. You know, today they have the two-handed controllers with many different buttons, but back when I was younger, we had the old Nintendo Square controller with the cross on the left and the A, B buttons on the right and start select in the middle. Anyways, John Madden got connected with the founder of EA Games, uh, Trip Hawkins. John knew about technology during his time as a coach. He used a video with a special pen called a Telestrator. The Telestrator opened the door for all coaches to teach their players using technology like never before. Trip Hawkins took notice while he was looking for a cover player for his next football-based game.
Tripp's first choice at the time was famed 49ers quarterback Joe Montana, but Joe already had a contract with Atari, one of EA's direct competitors. Tripp's second choice was Joe Cap, former quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings, who later became head coach at Cal. But because of disagreements with royalties, Tripp decided not to jo sign Joe Cap. His third choice was John Madden, and the game went on to unbridled success. Can you imagine if it had been either Cap or Montana instead? <laughs> Another interesting fact I need to add regarding stocks. EA is currently is publicly traded, with their stock currently valued at $133 per share. Back in 1988, when EA was first formed and signed John to be the face of the game, Tripp asked John how much stock John wanted. Keep in mind, at the time, it was valued at $7.50 a share. John's response was, I'm not here to talk about stocks. I'm here to talk about football. Tripp said, all right. Fast forward 30 years, and John said one of his biggest regrets was not taking advantage of Tripp's offer. There was no limit to how many he could have asked, 2,000 up to a million. And now the stock is valued at $133 to $140 per share. John already had the knowledge of technology, football, and coaching, all backed up by his background in education. That had propelled EA Games to one of the most successful video game franchises, which is now valued at over $300 million. Do you love Madden games? I love playing Madden 22. You can see the history of Madden games here behind me. Let me give you a brief history on, of the Madden game. Before Madden came on board, EA Sports wanted to make a football game. So in 1984, they got to work. But because technology was so limited, the game only allowed seven players on each team. Afterwards, technology improved and so did the game, allowing 11 players. Of course, in the beginning, all the players looked like robots, little squares going across the screen. John was always pictured on the cover of each game. But in 2001, the covers featured NFL players, starting with Eddie George. The first time two players were featured on the cover was in 2010, featuring Larry Fitzgerald of Arizona and Troy Polamalu of Pittsburgh. That was also the same year John called his final Super Bowl game, Super Bowl 43. In 2014, that year's version wasn't called Madden 14, but rather Madden 25, due to that year being the 25th Madden release. One cool thing about that year was you weren't limited just to that year's players, but you were able to piece together a team using players as far back as 1900. The most recent release had the second cover featuring two players, Tom Brady, quarterback number 12 for Tampa Bay, and Patrick Mahomes, quarterback number 15 for the Kansas City Chiefs. The video game taught us terms and how to use the moves such as the juke and the stiff arm. We also learned all about the plays in the game, which helped make the game that much more fun. Overall, we talked about John as a coach, a broadcaster, a video game voiceover artist, all of which cemented his legacy as an American icon and a national celebrity.
We've talked about everything John Madden did, but what about his family? Of course, we can't forget his wife, Virginia, and his sons, Joseph and Michael, who were born during John's time as head coach of the Raiders. So, we have Joseph, and we have Michael. Joseph went on to play football at Brown University, returned to the Tri-Valley area, which is Pleasanton, Dublin, and Livermore, and settled his roots here. Mike went to Harvard, also played football, and also came back to coach at his alma mater, Foothill High School. He coaches junior varsity and lives very humbly. Both sons were heavily involved in Pleasanton and around the, the entire Tri-Valley. John and Virginia were married 63 years, almost right on the nose. Their anniversary was December 26th, just before John's death on December 28th. Really, hats off to both of them for 63 years of love. I'm here in Pleasanton, on Main Street, just outside Building 548. But where's the building? The site where the building once stood is now a parking lot, which services the current building behind me, home to Inklings Coffee and Tea. The actual site was once home to a hotel, the first named the Grand Hotel. Established in 1863, it was known as a posh and majestic hotel. In 1881, a man named Jason Rose came, fell in love with the hotel, and decided to buy it, changing its name to the Rose Hotel. It played host to fam numerous famous people including U.S. President Calvin Coolidge, auto tycoon Henry Ford, and businessman Leland Stanford, as well as owners of horses who were competing at the Alameda County Fairgrounds racetrack. This was definitely one of the places to stop in the Bay Area for miners headed to the Santa Cruz Mountains, during the gold rush. Not to mention the wine scene is growing in Livermore, just 10 miles down the road. The Rose Hotel continued in operation for many years after Jason Rose's purchase, until the hotel closed its doors in the 1950s. The building was raised, and another building was constructed in its place, which you see behind me. Originally, this was the home of Round Table Pizza for around 25 years, before it changed ownership to what is now Inkling's Coffee and Tea in 2015. The reason why I'm mentioning this location is to help honor part of John Madden's story since coming here in 1967. There are a few more places around the city with special ties to Madden. I'll show them to you in a little bit. Here we have the restaurant where breakfast is held every morning. This is where John came to mingle with the people of the city, just to say hi, hang out, drink some coffee. He was a regular here before his death. See this cute building? This is the second version of the Rose Hotel, which takes on a Victorian style. The first version, which catered to many celebrities as I had mentioned previously, was located at 548 Main Street. This version is at 807 Main. But how was this building acquired? Well, we know that John and his family have lived here since 67. He raised his sons here where they graduated high school. They always had a soft spot for their hometown, Joe and Mike. Mike was always drawn to invest in real estate. 
he served on a board in Livermore, whose purpose was finding old, worn-down buildings and converting them into new, urbanized buildings. The idea was to using the first floor as retail space and using the upper floors as condos or apartments, which was the idea back in the year 2000. Mike took that idea and brought it to Pleasanton, also with a desire to bring back the Rose Hotel. After it shut down in the 50s, it always felt like a piece of Main Street history was missing, and the reputation of the Rose stood out. So Mike made the investment in the property. At the time, the property was home to a thrift store, owned and operated by St. Vincent de Paul, which sold clothing and furniture within the store for 87 years. Following the purchase, Mike had the building raised and built this version of the Rose. Interesting fact, the Rose is located at the intersection of Main Street and St. John Street his father. We're here at Foothill High School. As I mentioned, the, st the school has a deep connection with the Madden family. The family lives just around the corner on Foothill Boulevard. This high school is the second of its kind in Pleasanton. The first is located just outside of downtown. John's two sons, Joe and Mike, both graduated from here, and Mike became the JV coach, where he continues to work while maintaining his career in real estate in Pleasanton and Livermore. So the Foothill program still has that connection with the Madden family. You might be thinking, how has Foothill football been doing? Well, the program has been strong for many years, thanks to head coach Matt Sweeney. For a while, the program started to dip into mediocrity, but this fall, they have soared to the top of the standings. This year, they made it to the NCS Division II championship game before falling short. This program has always had a reputation for producing NFL-caliber talent. One current player is Kenny Olson, son of Las Vegas Raiders offensive coordinator Greg Olson. Another player, last name Millard, I completely forgot his first name, but his father is an all-pro defensive tackle Keith Millard from the Minnesota Vikings. Another fun fact, his older brother played football with my son Esau in the Pleasanton Junior Football League. It's amazing to have that sort of pedigree of NFL talent on the team, which means next year, keep an eye out for the Foothill Falcons. Look at this beautiful house! This is the home of the late John Madden here on Foothill Road in Pleasanton. I was born and raised here, and I always thought this was a prime spot for John because it was a shortcut to get to Oakland. No wonder the coach liked it so much. So, what are we doing here? This is Red Bear Properties. John Madden, the legendary football coach, broadcaster, video game cover guy, plus many more, wanted to help out his son, Mike, who was a realtor. After John's retirement, John invested in Red Bear to help Mike start buying property in Pleasanton. Meanwhile, Mike was on several boards focusing on buying and renovating old buildings, sometimes even demolishing and rebuilding on that purchased land. One of the big milestones was purchasing five buildings on First Street in Livermore, which was once Old Town established in the 1800s, and famous for its winemaking businesses. First Street is now home to various bars and restaurants. One of his other milestones was the purchase of property now known as the Rose Hotel. It's funny, when I first moved here from Southern California, people told me John Madden lives here, which, being a football fan and knowing the game and the history, left me completely in awe. Turns out, John owns about 40% of Pleasanton. 
of course, it makes sense. Through his years as a football coach, uh, sports analysis, and anal- sorry, football analyst, broadcaster, and video game franchise, it would make sense to use his wealth and invest in property through his son's business. This is John Madden's son, Mike Madden, the owner here at Goldline. This is where all of his father's awards are from his broadcasting years. Here at Goldline is where all of John's awards and personal collection are housed, including his 16 Sports Emmy Awards. Look at how cheap Super Bowl tickets were. Now they're going for nine to fifteen thousand. You see here, six hundred dollars cheap. Look, four hundred, three hundred twenty-five, uh, two hundred seventy-five, one hundred fifty dollars. Wow, cheap. Look, old equipment. This pass here is from his one Super Bowl win. An interesting fact, when Oakland Raiders owner Al Davis was ready to change head coaches in 1969, two young coaches were his final choices. John Madden, and Chuck Knoll. Of course, he ended up choosing John. But which one had the better resume? I think they're both about even. Chuck Knoll did end up winning four Super Bowls. John Madden won only one. But John's coaching reputation and his broadcasting brought America through this together through the spirit of football, which could never be matched. Plus, with the video game covers... I think John holds the slight edge over Chuck Knoll, so Al Davis made the right call. John came up with many words to follow the action on the field. But he also invented a unique tradition. Every year on Thanksgiving Day, the NFL would host games on that Thursday. John felt Thanksgiving shouldn't happen without food. Usually, everyone at home eats while they're watching the game. So John came up with the idea of adding the food within the broadcast after the game. Whoever was named the MVP was given a turkey leg to eat under John's orders. Of course, this grew out of hand as five or six players would end up grabbing a turkey leg after the game. The first such MVP was Reggie White, who ironically played for the Philadelphia Eagles, the same team who drafted Madden. The Eagles beat the Dallas Cowboys 27-0 on that day in 1989. That was just one example of John's creativity to draw viewers in. He was enshrined into the NFL Hall of Fame in 2006. John Madden was known for having a fear of heights and was claustrophobic. So how did he get around over a 33-year career of coaching and broadcasting and guest speaking engagements? He took trains, and he took charter buses. He decided to buy his own bus and called it the Madden Cruiser. He used the cruiser consistently until his retirement in 2008. 
The bus is currently housed at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. However, during this season's Week 18 game between the Raiders and the LA Chargers, the bus was brought out to Las Vegas to show the team and the fans what Madden used all those years. It truly showed that John's spirit was with the Raiders because the Raiders beat the Chargers that night in overtime in a thrilling victory. Interesting enough, that win also helped Pittsburgh get into the playoffs, which showed the true spirit between Chuck Knoll and John Madden. We're here at Vic's All-Star Kitchen, where John and his family were regulars for breakfast. If you ever wanted to meet John and his family, this was the place to be. But you had to be at the right place at the right time. The food actually is pretty decent. Another cool fact, the menu has all the features named for Pleasanton area high school coaches. In honor of the late John Madden and his family, for all the family has done for the city of Pleasanton, thank you. We all need to acknowledge everything the Madden family has done for Pleasanton. We're all very saddened by his passing, but his spirit still lives on in Pleasanton. <laughs> 